This is In The Loop. I'm Cody Legro in for Christian Bryant. And as we've mentioned before on this show, when it comes to UFOs and extraterrestrial life, we don't know much about what's out there, but we do know a good bit about one thing in space, trash. Literally. Okay, so from the moment humankind began space exploration, like with the launch of Sputnik 1 in 1957, we came to know the term orbital debris, or as scholars like myself call it, space junk. And we are not reducing, reusing, or recycling enough. So space junk is mostly made up of used up space shuttle parts, defunct satellites, and loose fragments from each of those. So by 2020, the roughly 2,200 operational satellites in space were joined by hundreds of thousands of pieces of satellites and shuttle debris of various sizes. And we know this, Earthlings are messy, okay? It's a huge problem. And the mass of debris in Earth's orbit totals nearly 7 million kilograms. And it ranges from obsolete satellites to tiny flecks of paint. While the debris can re-enter Earth's atmosphere and burn up, that process can take years. It's too complex of a compost, if you feel me, okay? And too much junk, it can be a bad thing. But in space, it creates new problems and poses risks to space missions and astronauts. They're bolts, they're nuts, they're scraps of metal, they're pieces of satellites. Those are the dominant things in space. Ed Liu was an astronaut at NASA for 12 years and now works for Leo Labs. It's a company that provides satellite and space debris tracking services. We knew that the, the number one risk to dying uh, per NASA's own, own uh, estimations uh, for a space station astronaut is being hit by orbital debris. It was then, it is today. More than 27,000 pieces of space junk are currently being tracked by the U.S. Department of Defense's Global Space Surveillance Network sensors. But this debris is special. It's too small to be tracked, but also large enough to get in the way of missions near Earth. So since both the debris and spacecraft are zooming at extremely high speeds, an impact of even a tiny piece of debris with a spacecraft could pose a big threat. If you want a stunning example of it, just know that a fleck of paint floating through space damaged a window on a European Space Agency shuttle at the International Space Station back in 2016. While that paint is stronger than your standard two-in-one primer, it did not do any major damage. But ESA said debris up to one centimeter could cause critical damage, and anything larger than 10 centimeters could shatter a satellite or spacecraft into pieces. And if all this space junk crashes into each other, it's bound to create more debris. And then that junk can cause even more crashes. So the problem just keeps compounding. It's an uncontrollable phenomenon known as the Kessler syndrome, named after retired NASA engineer Don Kessler, who first observed it in 1978. If you've watched the movie Gravity, starring my doppelganger, George Clooney, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And it has the effect of just about breaking up anything into a catastrophic explosion due to the energy of that collision. Collisions in space are not uncommon, and the debris they create are a global issue. In November last year, the five astronauts and two cosmonauts on the International Space Station were ordered to suit up and take refuge in their capsules. That was after Russia's planned destruction of one of its satellites that could have put them in the line of fire. But that was not an isolated incident. It wasn't even the only time space debris concerned ISS astronauts that week. And still today, remnants from that explosion are causing problems. So of course it's all happening at a time when space exploration is growing at an unprecedented rate. In 2020, we launched more satellites than ever before. And over the next few decades, SpaceX hopes to launch a constellation of 42,000 satellites. Other companies like Amazon's Project Kuiper, the OneWeb Corporation, and Chinese company Hong Yan, and the Canadian company Telsat are all planning to launch thousands of satellites into Earth's orbit as part of their own initiatives. So with these ventures, the challenge of space debris will likely only grow. So what are possible solutions? For more on ways to manage this problem, we're bringing in Space.com's senior writer, Teresa Poltarova. Teresa has previously worked with the European Space Agency and has written extensively about the problem of space debris. So Teresa, first and foremost, thank you so much for joining us. And in your work, 
What options have you seen in terms of solutions for the junk? And do any of them stand out as most promising? Uh, thanks for inviting me. And uh, when it comes to the space debris problem, it's a, it's a really complicated topic uh, that's been kind of just like growing in importance over the past years. So essentially, uh, what uh, the community is trying to do, there are several things, uh, but most importantly, it's I think there are many people in the space community who would prefer not to see that many satellites being launched. So there is a lot of kind of opposition against these mega constellations and people just think it's maybe not the wisest thing and safest thing to do. But once we have them, then we just need to figure out how to get this junk, which is uh, up there down as fast uh, as possible and there are several ways how to uh, do it essentially one of the most important thing is that when you kind of know that your satellite is kind of reaching the end of its design lifetime you need to kind of still have enough fuel left in the satellite so that you can sort of like bring it down bring it down and then it gets to the lower orbits and from there the atmosphere will just like slow it down and it will burn if it's kind of higher up uh, then maybe you know it dies and you don't have enough fuel to bring it down and then it can stay there for like hundreds or thousands of years and the longer it stays there the bigger risk it is so now there are some uh, technologies that essentially try to develop sort of like these space junk collectors you know like a garbage vehicle in orbit that would uh, essentially capture the piece of space junk and bring it down into the atmosphere where they both would burn I'm like trying to envision that, you know, space garbage truck. It's like a scene from the magic school bus in my head right now. So it's it sounds complex. It is fascinating, though. Um, is there anything individual countries or space organizations could do to reduce the creation of further debris? I know you mentioned, you know, maybe we shouldn't send uh, this many satellites uh, up in space, but any regulation on satellite production or similar effort to reduce more junk getting out there? Yes, so there actually are some guidelines that the international community has in place uh, that essentially every kind of uh, piece of space junk, a satellite that kind of uh, reaches the end of its uh, life in the low Earth orbits should be deorbited, removed within 25 years uh, after its uh, end of life. And if just like everybody in the world complied with these rules, it would be a much better situation. But unfortunately, these rules, they are not enforceable. So uh, it's kind of there and the community kind of, you know, some people try more, some people try less. But, you know, you have uh, countries like Russia who uh, they did the ASAT test, the anti-satellite, um, you know, test a couple of months ago. So they essentially deliberately created a lot of debris. So. Uh, you know, I guess um, most of the Western countries probably would try to comply with it, but would everybody? Probably not. And there is also a, a failure, uh, kind of the risk of failures. So let's say um, companies like Starlink or OneWeb is another mega constellation. They can have the intention to remove it uh, within those 25 years. But, uh, you know, let's say there will be like a 10% failure rate. So not every satellite that you that you try to remove, you will remove successfully. So the more satellites you have, the more of these kind of uh, pieces of junk will remain there because of these failures. So is there anything us earthbound individuals can do about this? Uh, well, I mean, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, I would just add that there is also another problem that like other scientists are concerned about this um, aspect of burning all this uh, debris in the atmosphere, and that is that it might actually pollute the higher layers of the atmosphere, which are otherwise really pristine, and that may actually trigger some further climate problems than uh, we already have. So it's a very complex problem, and uh, what we as normal people can do, yeah, put pressure on our governments to have these uh, rules and guidelines in place and make sure that they comply, but we can't control everybody in the world, unfortunately. Unfortunately, unfortunately. Well, Teresa, thank you so much for your time. We do appreciate you joining us on In The Loop tonight. Thank you for having me.